Cześć, witam was bardzo serdecznie dzisiaj w podwójnej roli prowadzącego i prelegenta. Bardzo nam miło, że mimo, jak rozumiem, terminu ferii dotarliście tutaj. Bardzo, bardzo nam miło i chciałbym was powitać na kolejnym wrogu w tym roku. Tradycyjnie trzecia środa miesiąca, następny też będzie w trzecią środę miesiąca. I chciałbym też oczywiście bardzo podziękować naszym sponsorom, firmom Daft Code, El Passion, Visuality i Rebased. Od nich mamy żetony, które Kamil może rozdać. Jeżeli ktoś nie dostanie żetonu, to przyjdźcie potem do mnie i dostaniecie żeton. Żeton to jest 10 zł w barze w postaci dóbr typu napoje i jedzenie. A ja dzisiaj chciałem wam opowiedzieć o kilkunastu, pewnie kilkudziesięciu rzeczach, które bardzo lubię w Rubim i czemu tak naprawdę ten język potrafi bardzo zaskakiwać. I jeszcze na początku zapytam, is there anyone who prefer this to be given in English? Okay. Okay. If, e, czy ktoś by wolał, żeby było po polsku niż po angielsku? To też jakby szczere pytanie. Okay, so once we had a situation where uh, there was a person who came to the meetup without knowing it's not in Polish and uh, they sat through all the talks and tried to uh, concentrate on the code snippets and uh, have i, after I learned that once, I, I just in case I made a slice in English and I'll, I'll give this one in English as well. Um, and of course, like if there's, I learned my English from reading, so if my pronunciation is uh, not uh, not legible, just please ask and I'll, I'll try to uh, explain this. So uh, those are basically things that I really like about Ruby in kind of going across the whole language. So uh, I do think it's full of gems and that's uh, kind of a very low pun on, uh, on the uh, package manager, but I, I think the language itself is full of gems and wonderful small things. Uh, also metaprogramming, which should never be used in Angular. Uh, also different implementations, which, also, uh, which um, kind of underscore the fact that uh, it is a widely used language. There is a wonderful JVM implementation, for example, that is. Uh, has a lot of um, great performance uh, advances, and also, for example, the, the new Truffle Ruby implementation. And I will also cover some protocols that I really like from Ruby itself. So uh, the core of the language is full of goodies. There are um, a lot of standard libraries that are not very known, mostly because they are quite obscure and maybe useful in this, you know, one project in 50, but still, it's interesting to learn that they exist and they actually perform things that are actually doable, like weak graph. Um, but also the, the, the core language that we use like every single day, there is a, uh, I really like this, this quote from Florian, uh, two easy steps to quickly get better at programming Ruby, read about enumerable RB, read it again. There are a lot of enumerable methods that seem absolutely not useful on a daily basis until you realize you actually re-implemented re one of them two projects ago because you didn't know existed. For example, uh, there is a partition method on all of the enumerables that partitions a collection into two given the predicate that you pass into it. So you can pass a block and if the block, for all the uh, objects of the collection that the blocks returns true, you will get them in the, like, the first resulting collection and all the others in the second. So if you have a collection of the first 10 numbers and you partition them by whether they prime, you will see a collection of primes and a collection of uh, composites and I won't necessarily uh, go into whether, into the discussion whether one is prime uh, if you know a mathematician that you really, really want to see getting angry, which is usually very interesting with mathematicians, ask them whether one is prime. Uh, there are also things like lazy enumerators, if you, you can create a range from one to infinity, and if you turn it into a lazy enumerator, you can actually select the first, like 
select all of the primes, but only take the first 10 of them. And only when you call 2a on that, this will actually get executed until like enough times on the range to get you the first 10 prime numbers. So uh, you can have an infinite list or an infinite collection of integers and operate on them as if uh, you didn't have any bounds. And until you actually execute the chained enumerator, uh, enumerators, uh, those won't be, thanks to the lazy one in the middle, those won't be executed. Uh, also, as I said, a bit more obscure method like slice before, you can pass, you can have a slice before method on every enumerable and it will partition this enumerable into arrays where the first element makes the block pass. So these are from the collection of the first digits, 10, 10, uh, 10 numbers, it will give you collections where every digit, first one is, every first number is a prime and the subsequent ones are not. So right before you get the next element that passes the block, in this case the check for primeness, uh, you will get a collection and that collection will always end just before, it will be sliced before the next element that passes the block. Sometimes those things are uh, really useful and if you want to have some really interesting head scratching, read the documentations on an enumerable size before because it's one of those methods from a very long time ago, like probably 15 years ago plus, which means, uh, for example, if uh, that, that there is a, the Ruby object interoperability back then was very different than it is now. Like we didn't have a lot of good practices that we have since then, so I highly recommend you to, to, to see how, how it looks like. And enumerable chunk, which is another method that seems super obscure until actually you have a use for it and need to re-implement it. It actually chunks the collection into, uh, it, it goes through your collection, it calls the block on every element, and as long as subsequent elements return the same value, they are chunked by that value. So here we basically say let's chunk this collection by whether the, the numbers are prime and the things that will be yielded to the block are the result, whether the, it's, it's true or false, and the whole chunk that actually makes this work. And uh, for example, a useful implementation of this is if you have a calendar and you say that certain days, like typical uh, weekdays are work days at, and certain, certain days are non-work days, for example, weekends, but also holidays. Then you can chunk your whole calendar by whether the given day is a work day and you will get shorter weeks and longer weekends if there are uh, holidays on Fridays or on Mondays. So this, this basically goes through the collection and also it, it, uh, it yields the, the result of this, of this block. So we can actually, it's a bit like group by, except it, uh, it, it, uh, it doesn't, you know, uh, make a hash of this. It, it doesn't collect by the key. It actually maintains the chunkiness of this thing. Again, very obscure until you have a use for it. And if you look at this implementation, you will see that actually if this block pass to chunk returns a symbol that begins with an underscore, this will blow up because those symbols have magic meanings for this method. Again, something that was really typical for Ruby 15 years ago and we kind of learned not to do that anymore, but for backwards compatibility, this is still implemented like this. Another thing that uh, a lot of you who use uh, POSIX based systems, Linux, uh, BSDs, Mac OS, I guess, uh, you know the grep tool and in Ruby, you can actually grab through a collection. You can call a grab, you, you can have an array of strings and you can grab all of the strings that match the regular expression of A from out of it. So it actually does work like grab on a collection of strings, but you can also grab a five out of a collection of numbers, out of a range of numbers. That's interesting. You can actually grab a range out of another range. And the reason, uh, how, like the, the, the implementation, how it works, what's the protocol in here, like how can you actually guess that this will work? I will cover this later in the, in the protocol section. So 
Uh, yeah, so we'll see a bit later how it's implemented that you can grab a range from inside, uh, from inside of another range and you will actually get all of the elements of the first collection. Uh, and you can also do uh, the things that are my personal pet peeves. If you have a range of dates, you can actually express them like a range of dates. So for example, if we have uh, a new date, like all of the days this year, which is the, the, the shortest way to write this is take date new 2017, all of the other values will be default, will default to January 1st. And then you want to have the last day of the year, you can just get the first day of the next day and do a minus one because Ruby lets you do this. And you can pass a range into the rand method. So if you want to have a random number from like 17 to 24, you can actually do rand 17 dot dot 24. But you can also pass a, uh, if you want a random day from this year, you can pass a range of dates from all of the uh, uh, days this year and you can pass it to rand. And uh, you can also, turn it into an array and just sample one of them. And also, uh, since Ruby, I think 2.1-ish, uh, you can pass a random key to all of the methods that actually do any kind of randomness, and you can pass a randomness source into this, which basically means if you want to check whether your methods are random, but actually want your tests to not fail mysteriously, you can actually pass a source of randomness, and it's not also very hard, especially in this, in this uh, case, to find a seed that will give you today's date. So I took all of the days of this year and found a seed passed into random new that will generate always, no matter how many times you try to get a random day from this year, it will always give you today. So uh, let's go a bit further, let's, let's do something different. For example, a very useful, uh, typical, situation where you have an array of ta table names and a method of getting per table results. So this is an example, you have basically some set of keys and you want to generate some data on this. For example, something like this, you have tables, accounts, contacts, and notes, and you have some method that generates results from that, for that table. This is actually from like a little bit uh, simplified, of course, example from one of the projects I had. How to best combine them into a table name keyed hash, so a hash where you have table names as keys and results of this method as values. And there are quite a few implementations, like the typical uh, functional representation from a lot of people who come from like strictly functional languages is to call reduce. The problem with this is you have to remember that the block passed to the reduce will also always has to return the collection you're kind of reducing into, so it's not like super legible until you internalize, and for a lot of people, this is probably some kind of a Stockholm Syndrome where I finally understood how reduce works, so I will now use it everywhere because it's obvious to me because I spent so much time understanding it. For me, a clearer example would be each with object, which is basically iterate through all the tables with a object that happens to be an empty hash, and the block will get the elements of this uh, collection and that hash, so you can do something like this. But there are other approaches that I actually like even more, which is let's create a collection of results that is in the same order as the names of the tables and let's just zip the tables with the results. A zip takes two enumerables and creates an array of two element arrays where you have like the first element from the first enumerable and the first element from the second one and so on and so forth, just like a zipper on a jacket. And then if you pass it to the hash uh, square brackets, you will get a hash. There is another implementation from Sam Ruby because I, I, I tweeted this problem uh, a few years back and, and he was very kind to, to provide this, which is basically let's map the tables into those two element arrays of table and results for table and then call to age on that collection, which I agree is actually nicer than that. But since then, I actually switched to doing this even different, even more differently, which is basically let's map those tables into the hashes of table results for table, which actually look like the thing we want to get, and then just reduce this collection by merging them all. Uh, of course, if you use anything like this, uh, be sure of the consequences. The last one creates a hash for every element. The ones with uh, uh, two age or hash square brackets also create arrays of two element arrays, so they are not very um, very fast and 
not very memory efficient, but also that's not the reason why we use Ruby and always first always benchmark because you say like don't use that one, use the one which you use because that's the, the most uh, memory and speed friendly. Like please provide benchmarks when you say things like this because in the vast majority of cases it really doesn't matter and uh, we use Ruby for readability. So uh, that was a kind of uh, what I like about different syntaxes in Ruby that we can get something. Another thing that not a lot of people know about and can be very useful sometimes, and surprisingly few projects do, but those that do it seem quite magical. So uh, I really like, uh, I really like uh, to, to show this. You won't believe, but there are times when third-party API leak tons of different exception classes. If you ever used a third-party API like <clears throat> AWS SDK, for example, then you can, especially in the older versions, you can see that there are you know, very different exceptions that are coming out of those classes. And it would be sometimes useful to be able to manage all of those exceptions from a third-party library in a kind of standardized way. And you can do something like this. You can create an API wrapper on your end that rescues all of the exceptions that come from that API and all which it does, this wrapper, is extend those exceptions by a module that doesn't do anything. It's just a named module and then re-raise them. Uh, just to uh, make this uh, clear from the get-go, this is no longer very inefficient since Ruby 2.1. This is not like extending objects in, on runtime is not as uh, painful to the performance as it was before. So it's like always benchmark if you say like this is very inefficient because it extends uh, objects in runtime. Also the whole exception handling situation is usually not the path where you need to do this like super fast. So uh, extending exceptions on runtime is actually defendable. And what this allows you to is you can somebody who uses either your library or you are using a third party API, you can actually then rescue that module and all of the exceptions that are coming from this, uh, this wrapper will be caught because rescue matches all of the modules that are, the, uh, all of the exceptions that are extended by this module through this approach. Also, if you don't like see the bottoms of the slide, I will have a, a link to the slides at the end, so so you can you can also like go through the slides later if you want to. And another thing that I kind of sneaked in here is uh, what is called method level rescue. You don't have to have a begin rescue end blocks if you do a rescue on the method level. Actually, the rescue keyword can be on the method level. And I like this so much that in general, when I see a begin rescue end block, I see whether I can't factor it out to a separate method that can be def something something rescue end because it also uh, makes it very elegant to uh, usually the rest of the code because the rescue blocks begin rescue end are usually not very, uh, they, they don't give a very nice flow to reading of the code. So exception tagging, this is from Abdi Grimm's Exceptional Ruby, which I highly recommend. It's a whole book about exceptions and it seems like a super small subject to concentrate a whole book on, but I really, it's not a long book and I highly recommend reading it. Okay, default parameters, something probably less uh, controversial, although we will see in a second. Um, what happens if you call this method with parameters one and two, if you call add one comma two? What this will return? It's not a trick question. It's in the name of the method. Three. Three, excellent. What will happen if you call it with just one? What, it will, what will it return? 42. Uh, so yeah, I, I highly uh, discourage you from doing this in production code, but if you have any kind of um, team-wide uh, policies about putting small jokes into code, uh, this might you, like you can single-handedly end that policy like just by doing this. So this is actually useful, like not, not, I mean not the first one, but this thing is actually useful because if you have a method called div that takes a text, but if, if there is no argument passed, it defaults to yielding, then you can do this. You can have a div with a string and this will wrap that string in a div tag, 
but you can also pass it a block and then it, would, it will evaluate that block and then pass it in a div tag. This is something that might be useful in some kind of a templating, templating language or something like this. And also, again, I'm sure there are more clever uses of very convoluted default values for, for parameters. This is again from Abdi Green. Uh, the literal postfix syntax. This is something that was introduced in 2.1. Uh, you, you can create, uh, you don't have to create rationals from strings anymore. You actually have a literal syntax like one slash three and the bar letter, letter R and this will give you one third. And also you can create them from bar floats and it will give you the uh, uh, the right number. Like it, it, it you, you don't have to go through uh, string conversion to get, to get these numbers anymore. And also uh, now we have imaginary numbers and also we have like a B method on strings that will convert a string uh, into binary encoding. Also a thing that is uh, well established by now probably is if you freeze your strings uh, on creation, your literal strings, they will no longer be recreated on every run. Uh, those will be actually, uh, the compiler will optimize this into a, a single shared frozen instance. So this is super useful. Ruby 3.0 will actually do this by default, all of the strings, like literal strings, and you can have this already in 2.4 by having the magic comment, uh, I think frozen string literal colon true. So metaprogramming. Metaprogramming Ruby, this is a wonderful book. I highly recommend reading it. Uh, it actually concentrates a lot on when you shouldn't do metaprogramming, which is most of the, of the time. So I, I really, with a cl clear conscience, highly recommend this book. I'm sure you, most of you know what method missing does, so I won't show you another example of method missing, but there are also other interesting things that you can do and other interesting places in object lifecycle that you can hook into Ruby, even though it's a, in theory, a scripting dynamic language. For example, when you create a new instance of an object in C Ruby, this is what gets ex executed. A piece of C code that we could try to translate into Ruby into something like this. So uh, basically a new method, a new instance method on the class. So this gets, because all of your, uh, all of your classes inherit for class, they, they, get, they get this as instance method. So like foo.new will call this. And uh, the reason why I mention it is that you might have noticed that if you return from the initialize method, you actually do not get from foo.new, you don't get what you return from the initialize method, you actually get uh, the object itself. So you cannot return something uh, surprising from def initialize. And the reason for this is because uh, the new method is implemented like this. It first allocates uh, an instance, then it sends initialize to it with whatever arguments the new got, and then it returns the initial al allocated instance. So if you, if you are a fan of tab, then you could do something like this, allocate tab, and then you send the initialize method. The reason why we use send here as an example is because the in initialize method is actually private by default. You cannot call like foo.allocate.initialize. And uh, another thing that I, I try to sneak in here is please don't use the send method, S-E-N-D, because there are various situations where this is actually a valid name for a method. For example, if you have a mailing system that actually sends something, then maybe the method send can be redefined. So uh, if you really want to, if you really need to do this kind of dynamic, very dynamic dispatch based on the symbol, for example, because this is private, please use underscore, underscore send, underscore, underscore. This is also easier to, to grab for. Uh, that's not actually true. The Ruby RB object alloc is not exactly allocate, and we can see that by redefining foo.allocate by writing allocate and calling super. And if you call foo allocate, it actually will print allocate, but will return a foo instance. This is because the uh, default allocate returns the instance, but if you do a foo new, it will print initialize, but it won't print allocate. So you cannot redefine allocate in this way. So it's not like perfectly true, but it's, it's an, this uh, is a optimization for performance. So like this is not perfectly true. But if, 
Let, let's see what happens if we do that. If I, I really wanted to understand what's wrong with it, so I pasted that code into IRB. And this is what happened. Like, uh, I took this code, which basically, uh, for the new method, it prints the new method and then allocates. So it redefines new just by, by printing new. And then for initialize, it prints the arguments and block passed to the initialize. And this actually works as expected. If you, if you run a thread script, it prints new, it uh, prints the arguments, it prints the block, and then it finishes. But if we paste this code into IRB, this is what happens. Uh, we paste the, the, the code that redefines new, and this is perfectly fine, it returns new uh, because the uh, definition of a method now returns the symbol with the name of the method in Ruby. But then we paste an empty line, and IRB prints new. Interesting, so it creates something inside of it, even for empty lines. And then we paste the line class foo, and suddenly realize that IRB creates four objects just for that one line. And then we paste def initialize args blocks, and like, this, is, this is what IRB uh, does underneath. Like for every single line, it actually does a lot of initializations. And uh, again, the line foo new one to block actually prints all of this. So please never play with object life cycles in IRB until you want to actually see what IRB does underneath in a kind of very mushy way. So copy constructor, who here uh, ever programmed in a language where they had to implement copy constructors? Like, right, things, things we kind of hoped are in our nice cozy corner of Rubyland are, are very far away from us, but there is actually a copy constructor. You can initialize, uh, you can define initialize copy method, and this is a method that will get called when you call dot dap, dot, dot dup on, uh, on your object. So this uh, for new prints initialize, then b equals a, and also the, uh, the a string, and then b equals a doesn't print anything because that's just another variable that, sh that points to the same object, but when you call a crop cut dup, then actually the initialize copy is being uh, executed, and you can see the object which we call this method on is being passed as the argument. So you can actually have a uh, copy constructor and this is like all of those years I was implementing dupe as you know, martial load, martial dump and martial load because I sometimes wanted to have like very deep copies or, or clones of my objects. Turns out all we had to do was, uh, all I had to do was uh, create initialized copy method. I wish I knew that. Uh, there is a wonderful hashtag team no idea on Twitter and there was this uh, great idea of uh, asking developers, especially seasoned developers, to post their Google queries because it's so much better for newcomers to see that this never ends. Like we still Google the super basic stuff and uh, it's, uh, you know, we also all things, I don't know how many of you knew, knew about initialized copy before but uh, I learned about it much, much later than I actually needed it, so. Uh, temp file. Temp file is this wonderful style library that has, uh, that creates a temporary file but also has the wonderful benefit of actually destroying it by the time your script ends. So, for example, if you write tests and the tests fail or blow up, you don't have to clean up your temp files, they actually magically disappear. And uh, another thing is weakref, which probably hopefully not many of you know about. Weakref actually lets you uh, say that some things are weak references and when there are a garbage collection run happens, they can be garbage collected even though, uh, even though otherwise they would be accessible. And the way Weakref that works is that it takes an object and you can call all of the methods that you would normally call on that object just on the Weakref, so it basically passes all of the calls but adds the weakref alive question mark method, which you can uh, check whether something still lives after, for example, a garbage collection run. So this lets you build a caches of objects that get garbage collected now and then, and all you have to do when you try to fetch something from that cache is to call weakref alive to see whether you need to rebuild it or it's still there because it didn't get garbage collected. So let's create ourselves a temp file 
let's uh, store the path to that temp file somewhere else so, so we can check for it, and then see whether the weak ref is alive, and then whether uh, the path exists in the file system, start the garbage collector, and then check this again. And it actually works, the temp file is alive first, and then the, the path exists, and after we run garbage collector, the temporary file is no longer alive, and the, the path is missing from the file system. So actually, this temp file got garbage collected, even though uh, we have a kind of semi-direct way of accessing it through the weak ref wrapper. So how does temp file show itself? How, how does it happen? How can we do something like this? We don't really have, uh, you know, we, we don't really have a way to call a destructor, like how, how does it work? Well, it turns out we do. We can define, there, there, on object space, there is a method called define finalizer, and uh, you can pass a something callable on that, and that thing will be called when a given object is garbage collected. So you can actually do things like uh, a temp file that deletes its own file when it's garbage collected, even though you are still in Ruby. And we can do this, we can uh, create a new instance of our foo class, wrap it in a weak ref, start the, uh, the, the uh, as you can see, the finalizers actually print that they are finalizing, and initializers puts their initializing. So when we do this, things actually happen as they should, which means the weak ref new foo new line in initializes the object foo new, then uh, we print before garbage collect, then we start the garbage collect, finalizing is called, so the finalizer is being called. Actually, this foo new gets destroyed and its finalizer is being called, and then uh, after garbage collect, we create foo new, and then the script ends, so this foo new is garbage collected at the end of the script, and that finalizer is still being called. So you can have things like uh, like uh, destructors or, or, or finalizers in Ruby as well. But there is a twist. Uh, when you run this way, because like the, the obvious thing is, why do we need to create a method and pass it? You can pass any callable. So you can just as well say that uh, my finalizer will be just a, just a, a lambda, like here, right? This, this should perfectly well work. Well, it doesn't. And does anyone know why this doesn't work? Like, why is this finalizer not called when the garbage collector runs? Only at the end of the script. Okay, so the answer is, this is a lambda, and the lambda keeps uh, a reference of its environment. In particular, this lambda has to know what to call ID on, and for this, it keeps the reference to self, which means the self, which in this case is full, cannot be garbage collected even though it lives inside of weak ref because weak ref is not the only thing in your system that keeps a reference to foo Object space also keeps a reference to foo that it cannot garbage collect because the finalizer actually accesses this. So this is why we have to do something like this, which is create a static finalizer and uh, then call uh, like this this method on it. Okay, next. There are a lot of hooks for metaprogramming. There's a const missing, which is basically method missing for constants, so you can act on your code when it tries to reference a constant that doesn't exist, and there are good uses and there are bad uses, and the bad uses are much more common. There is an autoload, please don't use it. I was a huge fan of autoload when I learned about it, so I don't blame you if you still use it. But uh, then I started writing multi-threaded code, and then I stopped being a fan of autoloading. And also, autoloading was set to be removed in Ruby 1.9, Ruby 2.0, and now it's set to be removed in Ruby 3.0, so we'll see, maybe it will get removed. There is a class inherited hook which can be called when something uh, inherits us, so we can uh, track what, what classes inherit from us. So for example, when we have some kind of uh, base class that gets inherited by many other classes, and then you want to see what different 
classes inherit from us. We, you can, for example, uh, uh, you can, for example, collect, and also those classes can be anonymous. It doesn't necessarily mean that they will be referenced by constants. And there are also hooks to modules. You can you, you can create code that gets get called when your module is included, uh, but also when another module includes uh, us and uh, this is called before included, like th this. I'm not sure I can explain this in, in, a, in a good way and it would take probably five minutes, but there, it's, it's basically uh, a very useful hook in a very obscure situations. Uh, also module extended, so we can, uh, we can catch when another object extends our module and extend object when uh, like this is called before extended, so we can uh, we can call things on that object before it actually gets our methods, and this is also what append features does. So we can do things to an object before our methods get added to it, or after our methods get added. This is this is the simplest way for me to to explain this. Uh, and this is the truth behind Rails concern and class methods, which I really don't like, but again, there are a lot of projects that basically disregarded the existence of concerns and its class methods sub module. But, uh, well, I have feelings about this and they are not very uh, positive, but I can, as usual, see certain uses where this is very elegant, but in general, maybe not necessarily. Um, there is also there are also hooks for creating methods. There is a method added hook that gets called any time a method is added. So, for example, you can. Uh, I really pity you if you have to use those things to debug stuff because it usually means something is very very wrong. But it's super useful to be able to do this when you need to. So you can actually call uh, pieces of your own code where methods are added to your object, and you can see when methods are added if you have a suspicion that there might be a bug in this process. Uh, there are also, there's also a hook where singleton methods are added, and you won't believe what module method removed, module singleton, singleton method removed, module method undefined, and module singleton method undefined do. Like they, they are also hooks for removing and undefining methods, and again, I've been in situations where I had to use them, and I, I really don't recommend being in those situations, but that's usually not, uh, by your own choice, so it's good to know that those things are, are, are there. And for example, for method added, if we if uh, we define a hook that prints that method added was called and then the name of the method that was added, so underscore, underscore, method, underscore, underscore is an object that holds the name of the current method, so in this case method added. So if this happens, when bar is defined, then method added with the symbol bar is called. So we print the method added is called with the symbol bar. The interesting thing about Ruby internals is that if you create a singleton method added hook, it will actually get called twice because it will get called because you just added it. Like the whole singleton method added, like those four lines, they actually execute them themselves because they are a singleton method. So uh, another thing that uh, hopefully won't bite you, but like, so, so this hook is called twice. It's called for bar, obviously, but also when itself is being defined for the first time. It's actually defined and executed right away. Uh, please don't use metaprogramming in Augur. Uh, active supports rescue from. I really have very strong feelings about this. There are cases where this is useful, and I concede that, uh, for example, in certain projects, in certain controllers, rescuing from common database exceptions and responding with a very clear cut and well-defined HTTP responses can be elegant when done with this, but please don't necessarily use it anywhere else and please think about every single time you use rescue from. Uh, I don't know, so, so the way it works is basically it gives you a class level handling of, of the given exception, regardless of which method raised it. So for uh, for controllers and race applications, this is somewhat useful because you can catch all of the record not found exceptions and, and respond with a 404. 
Uh, but it's basically like intercals come from. I don't know how many people here know the intercal, which is one of those esoteric languages. This one is about how languages should not be created. Um, so uh, I assume most of you know about goto, which is this syntax that lets you jump usually unconditionally to another place in the code, uh, which is not necessarily a good thing. So come from is a, the reverse of that. It, you declare it somewhere else and say that whenever you get into that place in that part of code, just come here without even knowing in that place that this happens. So this is basically how risk from works. Um, basically the exceptions are coming from outside of the call stack and this is, uh, this is uh, usually super frustrating when you have to figure this out. But I concede that in certain small elegant race applications on controller level, this can be useful, but please don't abuse it anywhere else. Implementations. Uh, the language has many implementations. Uh, you can check them via Ruby platform and Ruby engine. Uh, we've already seen things like GC start examples that might not necessarily run on other implementations, but uh, also things like object space might not necessarily be available on all of the implementations, but things like garbage collection access is actually sometimes very useful. Uh, the Unicorn web server, for example, uh, can do out-of-band GC runs, which means to not delay the response to the client just because your garbage collect collection happened to be running during this particular request. Uh, Unicorn can stop the garbage collect, do your whole request, and then start the garbage collect after responding to the client. And if you have any kind of application where shaving another 15 milliseconds of response time might be useful or actually having very consistent response times and not having some of them being stopped by garbage collection runs or delayed by garbage collection runs. This is an approach that is somewhat valid in, in, uh, with the regular caveats that when you stop garbage collector, you're basically on your own when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, not having garbage collector, collector in, in, in the background. Object space is not the same on all Ruby implementations, uh, but there are interesting things in object space that I highly recommend looking at. There is an ID to ref method. You can take an object ID, which is a number, and ask the object space for the object that actually has this ID. Uh, there is also weak map, which is the underlying implementation for weak ref. Uh, there is a comp objects method that gets, gives you allocation stats. So uh, if something creates in your system suddenly millions of strings, then you can check the count objects, uh, try to put it in different places and see where, it, uh, where the number blows up. And if you think, well, it gives me a hash, so is this hash being counted as a hash being created in your object space? The answer is yes, but if you want to not have this hash impact, uh, that you can pass it an existing hash and this ca existing hash will be populated with the results from count objects. So if you really don't want the count objects call to create a new hash or allocate a new hash, you can actually pass it an existing hash and it will populate it. There is an H object to iterate over the, all the objects. You can pass it the name of the class and it will only iterate of the objects of the given class. So you can see, for example, like find the largest string in your application at runtime. Uh, and there's a defined finalizer that we saw uh, already for per object destructors. Uh, I highly recommend watching Aaron Patterson talks uh, for uh, uses and uh, to some extent abuses of those things, but, but in general, he, he, he does awesome work of optimizing Ruby and Rails and explained that very well just by using those, those methods. Wickref, uh, as I said, it lets you create ephemeral objects that might not be there later if you need it. Uh, the, the, the reason I mention it again is because in MRI and CRuby 2.0, it's based on object space weak, weak map in C, but if you really want to uh, get your brain twisted a little bit, uh, up until uh, uh, CRuby 1.9, it was implemented in pure Ruby. And if you are curious how it's possible to create a weak ref in pure Ruby, then look into weak ref implementation in Ruby 1.9. And if you think that nobody would actually use it in anything useful, of course, Constantine has, has, a, has a use for it. There is a masterman gem that actually uses weakref in a very uh, useful, clever, and appropriate way. And masterman is, is uh, one of those gems that you might be using even though you don't know about it. 
And last part, protocols. Uh, these are the basis of Ruby object interoperability and also the cornerstone of Ruby's duct, ty duct typing. I, I mean protocols as in the, 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 the way certain methods should behave for your objects to behave like other Ruby objects. Uh, and, and it might be worthwhile to make your object conformant to, to those protocols. For example, type conversion, this is, uh, this is somewhat, uh, I think, widely understood example. So objects have two X methods that give you a very liberal interpretation of that object in that given uh, type. So you can have a string that, has, that says space 12 monkeys space, and you call two I on it, and it gives you the number 12. So this is like a very liberal approach to, to typecasting. But also there are uh, two XXX methods. So not two I but two int, not two S but two S to R, and not two A but two array. The only uh, one that not, does not conform to three letters is two hash. So we can have two H and two hash. And two H will give you, for most objects, some, some hash representation of that object. Those are for only for objects that are equivalent. So you will have a float to int method, but you won't have a string to int method. And the last type of type conversion protocols is the uppercase method names on kernel, which look like class names, but you call them like methods, so like uppercase integer, that uh, it will take a string and it will give you integer, but only if that string actually contains an integer and not like 12 monkeys, for example. So this is, uh, this is a, a good thing to use in to validating or enforcing input. And this time I highly recommend reading Abdi Grimm's Confident Ruby because that's, that's a great book about how to do uh, programming and on, on which layer of your programs to do, for example, input validation and at which layer you want to have which kind of assumptions about your objects. Uh, a short example about uh, square brackets, I actually uh, showed this uh, previously on, on Vrook, so I, I won't really delve into it, but you can uh, index into a bit of an integer. So if, if the number 35 is binary 100011, then you can ask it for the uh, second youngest bit and get a one, and the third youngest bit by indexing with two and get a zero. And we can do clever things like having a set of integers encoded as certain bits set to ones on a really big integer. And if you want to have a set of sets of integers, then you can just have a set of integers and each of them encodes other integers as, as the bits set to one. Uh, there is the protocol that you might actually know that says that the equal question mark method is for identity. So to John Smith's should be considered equal only if they're actually the same person and not uh, because they share their first and last name. There is the value equality with equals equals. So for example, two addresses can be considered equal if they actually are, are the same street, name, number, and city, and country. But two John Smiths should never be considered to be the same even if they live at the same address. They might be just a very uh, unhappy uh, coincidence of, of to people with the same name living at the same address. And there's this third method, equal question mark, which is checked for hash key equality. So if you want to create a hash with your object as keys, then you should really consider what the equal question mark method should return, and also what the hash method should return. So the way it works is, if you want to see whether a given object is already a key in your hash, then the method hash is being called, and if those method results are different, then uh, those two objects are definitely different. So this is like a quick check, cheap check whether things are uh, equal, and if the hash numbers are the same, then the equal method is being called. Uh, so if two hash calls are different, then it's definitely those two objects are not equal. If they are the same, actually the equal check is being performed. Uh, there was a wonderful bug about big num hash on Ruby 186 that, that really bite me, so yeah, that's when I learned that. Um, and also, uh, please again, don't shy for using range, for example, with dates. Let's say we have three Rook objects about uh, three Ruby users group, Pivorak in, uh, in Lviv, uh, Rook B in Berlin, and, and Vrook. If you have something like this, then you can create, for example, a wrapper, a collection wrapper of Rook list, 
And if you include a numerable and define an each method that, for example, iterates through all of them, then you can call all of the enumerable methods on your collection with you being able to hook into them. So obviously, if you put the rook name on that collection, uh, then, uh, then you get like this collection in this particular case will yield subsequent rooks. If you create two S on your rook, then you can uh, call that on all of those, uh, all of those elements. Uh, but also if you, for example, say that a given rook is finished if its end date is uh, in the past, then you can partition all of the rooks by whether they are being finished, even though you didn't define the partition method on your request. This is somewhat obvious because we included the enumerable module, but uh, the reason that all of the enumerable module methods suddenly work is because we defined the each method. So each is a typical case of uh, Ruby protocol, if your correction have an each method, you can just include enumerable and get all of the goodies of, of enumerable methods like partition. Uh, and again, there is a spaceship operator method that uh, tells you whether an object is smaller, larger, or equal to another. And if you define it, then you can uh, actually sort your uh, your Ruby users group by the date when they start. So if you only, the only things we added is actually whether a given rook is smaller, larger, or equal to another, and we suddenly, our collection of Ruby users group gets sorting just out of thin air because we added the space operator to those objects themselves. Uh, there are things like what happens if we compare a given object with a non-object, and this is a case where uh, we should return a nil from space repropagator. This is something that people not necessarily know. And a good example of that is the non-zero method. Like the zero method is a typical predicate that gives you either true or false. But the non-zero method is an interesting predicate that is one of those tricky predicates that don't return true or false. They actually return nil or something. And the reason they do this is like why, why, why is non-zero returning this? And the reason to do this is because in our implementation of the spaceship operator, we can uh, then define uh, our spaceship operator as a chain of non-zero calls on those other spaceship operators, because those operators will, non-zero will return nil if that other comparison is zero, so they are equal, and then the subsequent part of the chain gets executed. So we get a much more succinct implementation of a spaceship operator than we had in this particular case where we had this case, 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 when, 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 and else. This is basically compare the begin dates. If they are zero, then compare the end dates, if the comparison is zero. So uh, this, is, this is why uh, non-zero returns nil or a value rather than true or false. Uh, and Again, if you have this spaceship operator, you can actually uh, also include comparable, and you not only get comparisons, so you can say, for example, that Pivorak, this, like the most recent Pivorak was before Rugby, you can actually say that Rugby was between Pivorak and Vruk, and all of this only by defining the spaceship operator and including comparable. So it's not only smaller, larger, larger or equal, it also gives you method likes between. Uh, and the last one I want to mention is the, the call protocol. So anything that responds to call can be replaced by a proc or a lambda. This can be super useful for things like having uh, lambdas used in your tests for things that are actually being called in your production code. So uh, if your services respond to call, it means they can be doubled by and default to any callable. And this is always a kind of non-obvious decision because there is this camp that says call is so useful and so well understood that all of our service objects should have call methods. And the other camp that says Ruby is about expressiveness and those things that those services do are actually called something like deliver email and maybe that's how those methods can be, uh, can be named. And, uh, as usual in those cases, I think my answer would be it depends. There are uh, projects in which 
standardizing all of those to call actually makes sense, and there are projects where it doesn't give you a lot of additional value, so, so it might be better to, uh, to have a more fitting name. Uh, to proc is also, uh, I, I, won't I, I won't delve into it, but there's this wonderful tweet from Gary Bernhardt when he aliases the ampersand method into the method method, so you can do things like dates map ampersand asset ampersand close price on date and call it the pretzel bun. I, I was staring at this for 10 minutes before I understood what is even going on here. So if you want to uh, save yourself 10 minutes but still probably lose another 20, then uh, here is an explanation uh, as a kind of trivia. I won't dive into it at the moment, but uh, this basically lets you call the close price on date, which is a method on the asset class on w by passing all of the arguments that are in the collection, right? So you have a collection of things that you want to pass as arguments to a method rather than uh, call a method on each of them. So yeah, you, you can do that in Ruby as well. You probably shouldn't. Uh, I lied about call being the last one. My favorite protocol is actually triple equals. Uh, when you do casing, usually probably the most typical situations where you either compare input with some actual objects or with class names. And, but you can actually say like, if the input matches the regular expression of rug, then it's a rug. If it's between 1995 and 2017, then it's actually a date and a, a year when Ruby was alive. And you can actually also have a lambda or any callable in the when uh, part, and this branch will be executed if that lambda evaluates to true. And if we call things like this, so we, if, when we pass bar into our sorting hat, it will execute the when full bar bus because it, it matches the bar, so, so meta, right? When we pass a vruk name, it, will, it won't match the first line, but it will match the regular expression of uh, case, uh, uh, ignore, case ignoring rook expression, so it's a rook. Uh, when we pass a good clean fun, it won't match any of those first two ones, but it is a string, so it will match the third one. If we pass uh, 2009, it will be a year when Ruby was alive. When we pass today's date, which is the 15th, it will execute the odd branch, and when we pass the month, which is two, we will get the else clause. And how is this possible? How, how is it implemented? Are there a lot of edge cases implemented? No, the, the way it's implemented in Ruby is that people usually think that in case when uh, syntax, the input is compared with the things that, that, that come after when. So we basically do if input equals equals foo or if input equals equals bar, but that's not true. The, the, the thing that happens underneath it actually is the triple equal method called on the thing that is in foo. So it's basically if foo triple equals input or bar triple equals input or bus triple equals input, then return so meta. And the reason why it's done that way is because those triple, method, uh, triple equals method mean different things. By default, they mean equality, like for strings, but for regular expressions, it means matching. So we call slash rook slash i triple equals our input. It actually checks whether this regular expression matches that input. For uh, classes, or also, I think, modules, it's a check whether the given object is an instance of that class. For ranges, it checks whether the given object is inside of the given range. And for lambdas, it's an alias for calling. So basically, that lambda is called with input, and it returns either true or false, or something truty or falsey. So yeah, um, it says that, but it got cut off. So these are aliases. So uh, the reason why I like protocols in Ruby is because using them means proper object interoperability. And you can say that the given method takes an object responding to two path, and it doesn't necessarily have to be an object of a given class. It can be of any class that responds to two path. And uh, this means that uh, your test doubles can be common classes. For example, uh, if you have a repo that responds to fetch, then that repo can be uh, doubled by any hash. 
This is not a very good example and you shouldn't do this, but just a simple example. And there are many protocols in Ruby. There is an IO protocol that a lot of IO classes implement. There is this Marshall dump and Marshall load protocol that also can be super useful. And uh, if you want to delve into protocols a bit more, read on, on the course method, which, which does some interesting things. So to wrap up the talk, uh, please do dive into Ruby core and stdlib docs now and then. There's always something interesting, a little gem to be found there. Uh, play with object space to get stats on your code, uh, read up on Ruby's protocols. Uh, there are this, those two books are, I think, really good to know, even if you don't agree with everything in, for example, Confident Ruby, or you think certain approaches in exceptional Ruby are maybe controversial, I think it's valuable to know them and to, to read up on them. Uh, I highly, highly recommend Metaprogramming Ruby 2. And uh, those are, I think, my two favorite Ruby books is uh, Practical Object Oriented Design in Ruby uh, by Sandy Metz and 99 Bottles of OLP by Sandy Metz and Katrina Owen. So I also highly recommend those two. There's a, uh, there are uh, some pods by Arne Brasser on uh, SitePoint that are super informative. And you can follow Ruby Estedelib and uh, Ruby Strings on Twitter. They're not very active, but now and then something comes up and, and like the, the archive of those Twitter accounts is usually super useful. Like obviously it's Twitter, but there are very short, very interesting morsels of, of Ruby knowledge. Uh, finally, if, uh, if you want to skip a coffee or two a month, there is a Ruby Tapas, Avdi Grimm's Ruby Tapas, which are like short five minute screencasts, which, are, uh, which means they are short enough, you won't just keep saving them to watch later, but actually can watch them uh, right away, and, and I highly recommend them. Thanks so much, um, I'm Piotr, you can find the slides at talksjustonnet. Uh, I work at Rebase, and uh, if you have any questions, then by all means, Ask them now or downstairs. And I fully understand that it was a fire hose of small things in Ruby, so. You said you had to use these weird methods for debugging? Yeah. Do you know who wrote that code that did that? Was it some junior or like very seasoned developer? Uh, you mean those hooks or the, the code that I was trying to debug? the stuff that made you use them? Um, so, uh, the answer is uh, yes, which is basically sometimes it's a very seasoned developer who just gets too clever, or sometimes it's an actually bug in an interpreter or in a version of interpreter, and it turns out, for example, methods are suddenly defined in a different order, for example, in JRuby, uh, then, then in, or, or in particular in Ruby News, and then, then in CRuby. So, uh, sometimes it's both, and uh, sometimes it's just an obscure bug that nobody expected. And sometimes it's just staring you in the face, you just don't see it because it's a typo in a method call that calls, you know, method missing in a way that is not obvious. And only by learning that the method you see being defined is not actually being defined because there's a typo, then, then, then you learn the, that that saves you, for example, two hours of debugging otherwise. Thanks. <laughs>